<laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome, welcome to the Female Tech Entrepreneurs Offer Comp Impact uh, here at Horasis. I am extremely excited to be a part of this, this panel to discuss uh, what is actually happening in this space uh, around the empowerment of women. My name is Anna McCoy. I am the founder of Anna McCoy Global Ventures, and I have multiple entrepreneurial ventures that I have founded as well as partnered and invested in over the years. So uh, as we get started, <clears throat> I want to take a time just to introduce our uh, panel. And so panelists, I'm just going to do the round robin. I'll start with uh, Carrie. Uh, and just introduce yourself, and then we'll have uh, Angela, Angela, and then Anne, you'll come, and then I'll continue our, our uh, facilitation, but go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm also really excited to be here. My name is Carrie Cummings. I'm founder of The Mind Bar, which is an executive leadership advisory and coaching firm. I have a background in strategic management consulting. Um, I've worked for the, one of the largest consulting firms in the world, as well as for various luxury automotive manufacturers is my kind of specialty at the executive level. Um, I'm also a psychologist and speak about and coach individuals and teams in corporate settings um, on various subjects, mostly um, self-confidence, decision-making, um, the, the fun thing called analysis paralysis, overthinking, um, stress management, you know, all these things that kind of hold already successful individuals back. It's usually high, already high achieving men and women mm -hmm. um, that kind of hold them back from taking the crucial steps to level up, you know, and take the next step in whatever they want to do. So excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Angela. Oh, I'm Angela Huang. I founded Tempo Bioscience which is a biotech startup focusing on specialized adults, human stem cells and their derivative cell types. And most of the scientists who work with us um, come from pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies all over the world who are working on different diseases. So they use our product to test drug candidates and hopefully move them forward from preclinical to clinical phase testing. Mm -hmm. um, and development. And a subsidiary of Temple Bioscience is Presto Therapeutics. And we focus on the um, application of stem cells for therapeutic use there. And we work with mostly orphan diseases. So diseases that have no treatments currently. And yeah, I'm a scientist Ooh. by training. So this has been quite a venture. Um, Excellent. It's been exciting. Yeah. Sounds sounds amazing because it sounds like you're you're heading in heading us in a direction where people can he live more um, happy and effective lives. And so thank you for that. And Anne, I I I'm Lynn Glad here in San Francisco. And Anna, thanks for hosting us today. Mm -hmm. um, I am a veteran of the software industry. I started my own software company uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, after that company was acquired, I founded the first venture fund in 1989, focused solely on software investing. Mm. We've been investing now for over 35 years and have launched over 200 enterprise software companies. We fund companies right at the start. They're A rounds. I'm also mm. a trustee at the, my university, the University of, of St. Thomas in mm -hmm. St. Paul, Minnesota, and on the investment committee of the leading space tech investor, Seraphim Capital in London. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'd like to also thank our audience as they're coming into the room. I'm not sure if there's an opportunity to share this with in this community of, um, of Run the World, but you can also share it on your social media sites uh, as well. And people can also have an opportunity to see the replay of this. So again, welcome to this session, which is on female tech entrepreneurs offering impact. All of us are uh, have been successful and have certainly failed in many ventures in our own lives. And so during our panel today, we want to just take some time and offer up to the audience that is listening and uh, Tanya Wood, she's in our audience today. And if there's any opportunity 
for those that are coming into the room, you can be a part of this discussion by simply grabbing the mic and entering the conversation. So um, the first thing I think uh, that I would like to um, start this round robin with is Carrie, we're going to take somewhere between three or four minutes just to talk about uh, what's important to you around, I think you can take this from the standpoint because we have plenty of time with the size of our panel to talk about your, I think, talk about your lane, talk about uh, what you do as an entrepreneur, what your uh, opportunities maybe have been, maybe sh even sharing um, what your failures might be in the scope of this. And then we'll come back around to this and we're going to answer these questions around mentorship and some of the questions that have been posed as um, I think a part of our task to answer um, in this panel. So go, go ahead, Carrie. So just, so first um, my kind of personal experience, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, so, because I don't want to waste time, um, I yeah. started out a long time ago um, mm -hmm. in the, I had got an MBA, um, straight out of MBA school, got hired at a management, um, strategic management consulting firm. And, um, you know, I, I liken it to being put, pushed into a fast moving river. And I just, mm -hmm. I came out um, years later, uh, D d changed everything. Um, mm -hmm. Now, having said that, not because I wasn't successful, mm -hmm. but in fact, I was promoted constantly. I got asked to open the New York City office. Um, mm -hmm. I ended up not doing it. I ended up going back, getting a master's degree in clinical psychology, um, becoming opening my own business and doing combining those two kind of experiences and mm -hmm. I think um, one thing honestly that I feel like I if I had gone I'm very happy with what I'm doing and it was the right thing but mm -hmm. I do think that one of the things that held me back was not my capability at all um, mm -hmm. I had co constantly awesome feedback in different ways um, or validation but it was the feeling of I was the only female in in the group for years. I was in the automotive industry as my client. Um, and I was also very young. And I got, as a, I was a manager and I got interns asking me to write the meeting minutes, for example, right? Mm. Um, now, mm. I didn't, <laughs> but um, you know, it, I was in a very, very male dominated environment. All, at the same time, successful, I was maneuvering my way but I realized that I could have very gladly had a, a mentor, a female mentor, um, mm -hmm. but I didn't. Um, I kind of figured it out myself. And okay. I think that's one failure. I don't even think it's a failure, but I think that's one thing that I would have done differently if, if I could have, I would have sought out um, some females in the business. Mm -hmm. Kind of learning how to navigate the whole system. Um, yes. You know, I don't want to, you know, get yeah. too ahead of myself here on the Sure. And so, uh, Carrie, when you think about your entrepreneurial or your business experience, um, what are maybe three things that are out of your wisdom toolkit that you can share with entrepreneurs? Hmm. Well, don't try to do it all on your own. Definitely one, my number one. Mm -hmm. I, I tried for years to do everything. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely one. Secondly, um, also don't try to be too perfect. I have mm -hmm. lots of degrees, lots <clears throat> of different certifications and trainings. And, you know, I, I kind of realized at some point in time, you know, I'm just do it. I, you're, you're good. You don't need any more. So, um, mm -hmm. Start doing things, do things, get into action. Um, mm -hmm. So that's uh, definitely another piece of advice I would have, uh, I would give to people starting out. Mm -hmm. And um, really important, get funding. And it sounds very simple, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it, it kind of ties into the first point. You know, don't don't try to do everything yourself. Um, go get mm -hmm. funding, get a team, get a, get support. Okay, excellent. 
next, I'll uh, go to Angela. And Angela, go ahead. You can share, uh, just share a bit about your, uh, what you have to offer to entrepreneurs. And uh, I'll chime in uh, with a question, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. So trained in science and especially in neuroscience, um, I think coming out to work on products for bioscience was really out of need as, as part of the scientific community. We make products that are useful for loss of disease modeling purposes and therapeutic applications. Mm -hmm. um, but as an entrepreneur, I think now looking back, some of the things I would have very much like the mentor to come in and help set up some of the thinking and the processes would be say, technology and product differentiation, how to really communicate those things clearly to an mm -hmm. investor, um, mm -hmm. business model, and also alternatives to business model. I'm a scientist, mm. so so business model, finance, um, these are new to me as, as I started out. Mm -hmm. And how to explain um, and also reach goals in terms of returns of investment, the ROIs for investors, mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. to explain that and communicate that. Um, and also from a personal personality point of view, it was more like relationship building. It'd be mm. great to hear from um, other professionals, how they build relationships with um, professionals coming from a very different background than yourself. So from mm -hmm. us, it's like we are in science and of course, I'm most comfortable talking to scientists, right? Mm -hmm. um, I've been in it for long enough to know all the personalities and how everyone is and how we approach problems mm -hmm. um, and questions. So, but as I've learned is that um, professionals from business, finance and other backgrounds, they think very differently. So how do you mm -hmm. explain the question? How do you mm -hmm. um, approach a situation? Um, so, and, and still be authentic. Um, and explain what you're trying to solve um, mm -hmm. in the company and deliver for, for the community and the customers and et cetera um, in the industry. So I think these four areas would have been um, very helpful mm -hmm. um, instead of having to learn along the way. Um, okay. So I'm lucky is that my advisory board members have been amazing. And I think each one of them has sort of come in to help clarify these areas um, along the way. So we've had mm -hmm. a lot of open discussions um, mm -hmm. about how to approach the technology differentiation mm -hmm. and business model and financing. So, yeah, those are um, just my intro for anyone who is interested in starting out in biotech. It's mm -hmm. a very special industry. Um, mm -hmm. part, it's a highly, highly regulated industry. Mm -hmm. um, and for good reason, because mm -hmm. FDA, EMA, they're all needed. Um, also, other countries have their own regulatory agencies. Um, yes. So, yeah, it's very neat, very much needed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the financing aspect for biotech is also very different from tech. So anyone mm -hmm. who wants to come into bio mm -hmm. needs to keep that in mind. So what, do you, what we hear about tech startups mm -hmm. almost never really apply to biotech, although mm -hmm. we share the word tech <laughs> yes. in the name. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and how investors feel about business model and ROI and valuation, it's very different in biotech. Mm -hmm. So that's all I have to say as an intro. Okay, that's excellent. All right, thank you so much for that. And then I'll, I'll just circle back with some questions. And uh, so now I'd like to invite uh, Anne to the, to the floor and just share a bit about your experience and what you have to offer from your wisdom nuggets uh, to this panel. And then we'll, we'll just do a round robin of questions. Yeah, it's, um, as a venture capitalist, um, we have the privilege of auditioning the future every day. Uh, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the people that present to us are not underachievers, they're overachievers, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. all of us on this panel today. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. One of the lessons that I would share is that the path of an entrepreneur is not the same as the path of someone working in corporate America mm -hmm. or corporate global. Right. And the, the shock to me was uh, not starting my first company. Uh, I was fortunate I started in the early days of the software industry, mm -hmm. uh, but it was starting the venture firm. 
And I had no idea what it was like to go out and raise a venture fund. Mm -hmm. I did not know how closed the system was. And Mm -hmm. frankly, doors hadn't opened for me versus Mm -hmm. shut for Mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. So after 130 pitches that we gave, my partner, John Hummer, and I, Mm -hmm. saying we were going to start the first venture fund focused on software, where 130 potential investors in our fund said no. At that point in time, it's pretty easy to give up. Uh, But if you're a true entrepreneur, you really see no as a challenge, Mm -hmm. not as Mm -hmm. a door shut, Mm -hmm. but as an opportunity for you to really find your right fit in this giant puzzle of funding. Mm -hmm. The challenge for us was people saw software as a very dicey investing area, which of course Mm -hmm. did not turn out to be. we, I then went back to, I was in Silicon Valley at the time. I went back to my hometown, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and pitched to a corporate investor, 3M Corporation. They in my own software company from scratch. They, they were the first commitment to our venture. They then called other investors. And suddenly we had raised a first fund. Mm-hmm. Now, we were entering a really closed system at the time in 1989. Mm-hmm. Many venture funds. And traditionally for people raising money 20 years ago, it was a very small system. A uh, n- small number of venture funds, mostly in Silicon Valley, uh, it was inside baseball, as we say, from a sports analogy here. The good news is that that has changed. Uh, there's, there are an enormous number of funding sources now, and they're global. There's almost $2 mm-hmm. trillion dollars of dry powder out there for mm-hmm. the right asking. But it still means that you're going to have to go on a track where you get a lot, lot of no's. Mm-hmm. And, uh, We see a lot of people just retreat from Mm -hmm. that. We Mm -hmm. see a lot of good businesses where we think they're fundable, but they're not a right fit for our firm. So we say no. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you have a bad business or you're not going to get funded. So for me, the the lesson was it was shocking to have so many no's as a successful (laughs) overachiever. So my um, bit of wisdom is that you have to build meaningful relationships along the way. And I went back to a meaningful relationship uh, to get my start. And Mm -hmm. that was not just a relationship where they funded us, but they helped us achieve the rest of our funding. They picked Mm -hmm. up the phone and called IBM Corporation Mm -hmm. and said, you should listen to John Ann. They have a great mm-hmm. pitch uh, mm-hmm. and, they're very, and they're very investable. Mm-hmm. So the uh, two things here, you will get no's, even if your whole career, especially your career in mm-hmm. academia, your career as a young um, person in, in a successful company that mm-hmm. be prepared as you grow Along the way, some doors will be shut for you, but they don't mean that you should walk away. Mm-hmm. And walking, walking away from our ideas, from our passions, you know. Uh, thank you for that, Ann. You know, there is, you know, I, I have this burning question for you, and it's about Napster. You know, uh, I think your firm did some investing in the early stages, right, with Napster that's, that went on to become probably many iterations later. But it was such a, um, you know, it was such a disruptor in the music industry. How did you go about doing, doing that investment, if that is correct, based on my research? Well, there's, uh, you know, we're prohibited from talking about a lot mm-hmm. of aspects about Napster. So oh, okay. Some- Sure. sure. Um, Certainly uh, the best investments are ones where they find a huge unmet market opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that in many cases involves disrupting the past. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Not always. Sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talked about uh, the luxury car market. Talk about mm -hmm. disruptive past with Tesla. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Tesla is both a revered company because of their mm -hmm. innovation mm -hmm. and a disliked company because yes. they've disrupted mm -hmm. uh, in many, many ways mm -hmm. uh, what was before. Okay. And Napster was a disruptor. Mm -hmm. the, the companies are more successful if they find a way to um, to, to sort of bridge the gaps to disruption mm -hmm. that they bring others into the fold. Yes. Um, and the, mm -hmm. one of our assumptions about Napster was that, well, it was clearly a disruptor for those that were aware of digital transformation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very early, that we would be able to bring others into the fold mm -hmm. uh, and that turned out to be extremely challenging as yes. history has revealed. Yes. Well, you know, what, what I think what's even more, more interesting about this, this process is being able to um, take that chance to, to, to like see the, you're really taking a chance on the future in those disruptions. When we think about Uber, we think about Airbnb, Tesla, all of these are disruptive companies that then ultimately they, they find their balance and they create new ways of new ways of doing things that then become more the traditional way of, of how we do things. It becomes a part of our culture. And so, uh, but that's, that's interesting. And, and uh, it's just great to hear from you and to actually have an opportunity to talk to a person that did have, uh, you know, that you saw that as a, your, your firm saw it as an opportunity for the future. So that says something about you being, or your team being able to see the horizon. And so congratulations. And I know it came with a lot of pain and suffering too, but uh, doing that happened. So even as ladies, as you were sharing, um, and for our audience that, that's listening, I think uh, my approach, and I'd like to take just two or three minutes to share my, my maybe a, a point of wisdom or perhaps where I see um, you know, entrepreneurship going, you know, where I see, you know, it's always been here. It's millennial in, in nature. Uh, but when we start to talk about when higher education begins to create programs and degrees around things, and that's happened in the last 20 years. Uh, when I went to school, uh, it did not exist. I was misplaced as a, um, you know, a person wanting to be educated. I started my very first, I would say, entrepreneurial act. I'm one of five children for my mother and the final child of my father's 13 children. He was older than my mother and had multiple marriages before my mother. And um, what was interesting about that for me is entrepreneurship was a needful thing in my family. You know, we were not very wealthy. We, we grew up uh, we, wealthy, not wealthy. Girl, we didn't know what wealth was. Let's just explain it that way. We grew up in Houston, Texas, in Quitman Court, one of the fifth wards. Uh, uh, out of all probably probabilities, I would never have been, you know, if you came around and you looked at these, these children, and this one was from here, my life in the way it's gone would never have been one that should have happened. And so for me, I think when I think about entrepreneurship there, all of us have this kind of, we come into the world with this kind of curiosity and somewhere along, along the line, you know, for me at five, that curiosity was far stronger as it related to making money than it was for my four siblings. So my first opportunity, I was six years old, moved to a new neighborhood, walked across the street, met my neighbors. I mean, met them all, you know. I told you, I'm, you know, talkative, obviously. And one of them had a ceramic shop in their garage where they would make ceramics and they would sell them. And I started going over Miss Rose's house. And, you know, I like Cheetos. That was my thing, you know, give me some Cheetos. And I was one of those kids out of the five. You know, if you gave four kids Cheetos, one would eat real fast. One would keep it slow, keep it long, roll it up, put it on the side, wait till everybody eat theirs and have everybody beg them for it, right? And then I would sell my Cheetos. You want some more? How about what you got? So I realized that something inside of me 
had an understanding of money exchange. I went on at the age of nine, started a, that was my first marketing business where I created these flyers, stick houses, like, you know, just a square stick house with a triangle, the circle and a smile and a frown. And I said, your house looks like this now as a frown. We'll make it look like this with smile. And I was the youngest of all my family members. And as a result of that, they were boys. So I got them to paint people's houses. I'm nine years old. By the time I am 12 years old, I am running a record shop in my neighborhood that belonged to my uncles. I'm tall. I'm, I'm five nine now. I was probably taller than most of my peers. I ran that shop. I ordered eight track tapes. Uh, at that time, we still had, the, I think, maybe the 76s, the, the LPs and all of that. So I learned business. By the time I'm 14 years old, I am working in a grocery store. By the time I'm 16, I'm running that grocery store as a manager when I get out of school. By the time I'm 18, I am opening video stores across Texas. So there was something in me that I had, I had garnered all of this knowledge and this experience. By the time I get to college, I only have a choice of doing some liberal arts college and I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm appointed to the Air Force Academy. I've got all kinds of scholarships and I go to Spelman College, historically black college and university, and I get a 1.3 cumulative grade point average. That's only because I was not interested in what I was doing. And I dropped out of college and went on and became some, someone, the greatness that I am. And ultimately in the last 30 years, our firm, we've raised $800 million. We've done over several billion in, in projects. We do master plan communities. But again, and I didn't finish my education. I finally got my degree in 2020 because they canceled a, a requirement that I needed. And I, you know, uh, what do you call it? Applied for it, appealed for it, and got my degree after 30 years. So, but again, when I think about as an entrepreneur, some of us have it. Some of us, as Angela saying, she says, I'm a scientist and I, I just don't, uh, you know, I've got to bridge the gap. Well, Angela, I would say to you, yes. And what you really need is a really good second who understands your field, but also understands and have a strong knowledge base and a passion to sell your ideas, not your product, your ideas and the products support that. And so I would offer up to those entrepreneurs and, and frankly, we have mo all men that are listening to us today. And I was going to share where I see entrepreneurship going for women. And I think we're at a different place and than you were 30 years ago. We are now those decision makers. We are now women that have built wealth there. I'm in my, I'm close to 60, but we're the women that are now, we have funds we may not have the largest fund, but we'll take the chance on women. We'll ch take the chance on ideas. And oftentimes when we're thinking about venture funding in those early stages, it's not multiple millions of dollars. You know, it might be a half a million dollars. It might be a hundred thousand dollars that gets that entrepreneur over, over the bridge, right? To then, as you said, and pick up the phone and start to tap into some of those relationships. But with that being said, I think it leads us across a bridge where we've talked about, where we talk about mentorship and reframing what mentorship now means for women like us, right? With younger women like Angela, we can see that you're, you're the next generation coming forward. How do we mentor? How do we reframe and, and, or establish what mentoring means through challenge, through support, through relationships. And I love what you all shared as it relates to how you were. So let's dive into that space around mentorship and, um, and come from a place that maybe you didn't receive that you would like it to look this, this way. Maybe we talked about a wish list. What does a wish list, wish list look like for the next generation of entrepreneurs who, in my opinion, have their, their, their bridge is different and their steps are different. You know, they have a lot more uh, maybe tools and, and support and technology that 
can accelerate their their process. So how do we help them? Anybody can dive in. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I, I can start uh, very quickly here. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, we, we each have the domain that we live in. And, you know, I live in a domain of uh, tech entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. uh, not biotech, but broader tech. And, uh, you know, if when we fund a company, um, one of the most important things that we do is uh, choose the CEO that we're going to support. And we're talking about not just women getting funded here, but women actually leading organizations. Mm -hmm. And that in many cases, that is the founder. In many cases, we help uh, the founder recruit a CEO. So what has made the best CEOs of the hundreds of companies we've funded? Number one, I would say that uh, the CEO knows what they don't know. Mm -hmm. I think it was mentioned earlier that the goal of mentoring is not to perfect a person. Mm -hmm. It is not to make them all knowing of everything. It's really making them aware of what their weaknesses are and how we support those weaknesses. Uh, that's, you know, how we help our CEOs hire to, to, to support their strengths, but also support their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Second, the, we, somebody talked about authenticity. And really what that means is your <clears throat> willingness to be honest about yourself. And honest about, hey, we made a decision and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really hard when you're running a company to admit to your stakeholders, be they your board, your employees, uh, or your colleagues, that, you know, we, we've got to do this differently. And that is a big role for your supporters to play, that you have an inner circle of trusted relationships. And these trusted relationships are clearly the most important mentors you can have where you can be honest. You can be not just authentic, but honest. And because sometimes truth is painful, not, not happiness. So th that's what I would say about uh, mentorship is it is along the way you have to build this these trusted relationships and meaningful relationships. And as you progress to getting funded and running your companies, that kind of relationship has to exist with your board members, your inner circle team, all of your stakeholders. Thank you for that. Um, Carrie? Yeah, I, I, I love what you said just now about being honest about mm -hmm. yourself and also mm -hmm. your weaknesses, especially. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I think this is one of the things I constantly talk about is being okay with not being perfect, you know, and, mm -hmm. and really just not closing, not shutting your eyes to it, not wanting to distract yourself, but looking that front on and being okay with that. You don't have mm -hmm. to be everything to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, if you're willing to be honest with yourself, that is true. I truly believe is the only way towards the, the only the only way forward and the only way towards growth. Um, and another thing I think is, um, you know, I I'm coming from the individual level of um, really mentorship is what is what I'm doing, and we're starting with ourselves. Um, I think that it's important though to have a kind of kind of like a, a team of different kinds of mentors um, that can play to or can can move you forward in acquiring the right skills or the right people, like you were saying, the right people mm -hmm. to complement your strengths, but also where are you starting from within and, um, and being able to look honestly at yourself um, and also being able to handle um, challenges that come ahead without giving up. 
And I think mm-hmm. that's so many times people give up right before maybe their breakthrough happens. And mm-hmm. as you were saying, you went to 130, I think, investors. That's what you said. Um, it reminded me of, you know, book writing, you know, going to 130 different publications. It's it, it's applicable to so many areas of business and life and, and different careers is um, realizing who you are and keeping, um, you know, being okay with being who you are and authentic and just bringing that to the world and and you will find your mentors if you're being honest and authentic with yourself i think that's important um and my take on mentorship in itself is i think there's different kinds of mentors out there you know um when i was in management consulting i had a mentor who was actually my my boss and he mentored me in the sense of give, helped me give me opportunities that would challenge me. Mm-hmm. Right? That were not fun, that were tough, that I um, sometimes hated him for, but he pushed me forward and forward and forward. And that was, I'm very thankful for that. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a tough mentor. <laughs> so that's, there, that's there, one of our mentors, the tough mentor, right? Go ahead, Anne. Did you want to chime in on that? Yeah, I, I think one... Um, one thing to point out here is that you're not going to find answers with mentorship. And this Mm -hmm. is a confusing part as well. Mm -hmm. Um, In the end, wisdom is yesterday's news. Mm -hmm. Um, You're plowing ahead into the future. If you're really a founder of a new company or running a new company. So you're dealing with a whole new set of assumptions about how this will unfold. You have to have, enough confidence to trust your own judgment, Mm -hmm. but you have to build a strong set of assumptions around your own personal trust. Mm -hmm. It's not just pure confidence and plowing ahead. So you really are on your own. I think that was mentioned earlier Mm -hmm. when it finally comes to making critical decisions Mm -hmm. and you have to trust your own good judgment. Mm -hmm. I love, if I jump in real quick, I love that. Mm -hmm. That's, I, I preach about, you know, intuition and recognizing your inner voice. I think that's so important to, because this is your kind of your compass, your inner compass, mm-hmm. not somebody else telling you something, but mm-hmm. you're, you're, at the end of the day, you're, you're on your own. That's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With your decisions. Yeah. Yeah. That's and excellent. You talk about, you know, people being over mentored. I think yes. this, this concept comes in is the search for answers from mm-hmm. other people versus mm-hmm the continuing mm-hmm. ability to learn mm-hmm. yeah. is something you're doing right. on your own. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, my perspective, and then I'm coming to you, Angela, um, when I think about uh, mentors um, and I am a mentor, um, I took mentoring to an extreme. Okay. Uh, that must be my personality, <laughs> but I've only, when I truly say mentoring, I've only mentored maybe four to five women in my life, right? And when I say mentoring, when we think about mentoring, mentoring in its true sense is taking a person and really working with that person, like like relieving that person of their duties in life in some ways, right? Their duties, maybe whether it's their Uh, to make life easier for them, right? So that they could really learn. And I would say that I've only done that with maybe three to four people where I've, I've taken them into my home to mentor them in business, to mentor them in their own personal lives. I've either created an environment where I've paid for them to do the work that they're trying to do and relieving them of the financial part of that and we work through a period of one to two years where I'm really helping them take that leap in their business. So that's when I say extreme, I've done that kind of mentoring, but I do not do the kind of mentoring where people will say, will you mentor me? I know I'm not your mentor, right? I, now I'm an advisor. And to me, I make it clear about what that advising role. And so maybe we should be looking for mentors who don't have the capacity to really engage with a person in their lives and kind of do life with them. They're not their all, 
But that mentor is a person that really comes alongside of you and they believe in you, right? They do pick up the phone and they call people. They do help you through mm -hmm. difficult times. They make a way so that your way is easier. That's how I mentor. And we work on business. We work on your ideas. We work on those. And I hold that person accountable because I've paved the way for them. And I've removed what I call suffering. Right. So that creativity and that willingness to and that desire to learn and to do actually comes forward. And so when I think about mentoring, I don't mentor, but I do. I am an excellent advisor. I am an, a when I talk about what I bring to the table to any of the individuals I work with. I have this gift mix of coach, of strategist, of relationships of advisors and that is where the value is and so i think that if we change what we're looking for i think we can change what we receive that can help us to advance these things and i absolutely agree with these women around your own intuition about you know and that question is never you know if you ask me a question i'm asking you the same question well what do you think Right. And that's going to come right back to you because we believe that you carry the knowledge base for the, the space that you're moving in. And so what's your perspective and how you have been mentored, uh, Angela? Um, I think of mentors the same way as scientific advisors. I, mm -hmm. It's because I've spent 20 years um, mm -hmm. doing science mm -hmm. and that that idea of who is a mentor is really just who is your scientific advisor mm -hmm. equivalent okay. or who's your business Got advisor. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what I've learned from doing science for almost 20 years now, since I started very early um, in college to do research uh, work, is that you basically, an advisor can only take you so far. Mm -hmm. They can bring you to the door. You have to open it and explore mm -hmm. the house on mm -hmm. your own. Mm -hmm. And you'll learn things that they're not going to show you what to learn, mm -hmm. how to mm -hmm. learn, mm -hmm. and what you're going to get. So mm -hmm. some projects that I have explored early on, um, they're not meant to succeed with glorious results to publish or to present. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the experience. Mm -hmm. And that sort of tests someone are you really interested in the science? Because this is mm -hmm. the process. Mm -hmm. So, of course, to, to uh, finish projects, you do have to choose projects that deliver results <clears throat> and things that you can present. So one of the things that a scientific advisor would teach you is to explore different areas, explore different ideas, have them challenge each other, and then see which one will really give you a result to move forward. Um, but all results are useful because they will take you somewhere and it's part of the process. So I guess what I've learned from that is mostly just the mentors who mentored me in science to be mm -hmm. an independent thinker. Mm -hmm. And um, you have no one but yourself and your own judgment mm -hmm. to fall back on. That's excellent. And that is the scientific process. So mm -hmm. I'm taking what I learned in science. Um, yes into the startup world, which has had, you know, ups and downs and challenges here and there. And I think one thing I would add to what I learned in science is that in the greater world outside of science, the relationships that you build with others and to have relationships with um, finance and business background professionals mm -hmm. is very important and you mm -hmm. need to build those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so I guess it's to expand on more learning really mm -hmm. to, to move forward um, with ideas that you want to pursue in the commercial industry setting. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's different. Well, you know, and this is, uh, I don't know if uh, you all have been to Harassus in person and I can tell you there are a couple of ways to approach this uh, process. Um, what I found, I've been involved maybe five years or so. What I found is that if you're a part of this community you can reach out to people. And certainly it's a strong uh, connection, obviously, on LinkedIn. Um, and what's really important is that if there are people, if you go through that program and there are people that you want to reach out to, a lot of them will respond because you've been a part of this. And I, I know that in person, it was so easy to make connections. If you did the homework 
and say, this person, if I wanted to meet Anne and I was there, I will find Anne. You know, and the fact that we have all joined this community, it's a great uh, way to continue to build the relationships that you're looking for. You just have to, don't leave it here at this panel. Go into the other panel uh, communities and start to make the connection. Get into the, uh, another one is the quick one-on-ones. You know, do a few of those before you just disappear for the next couple of days. And you'll, you'll be surprised how many people you meet. So we're at the end. So thanks for being a part of this, everyone. And do take uh, advantage of our time that we have together in Harassus. And hopefully we'll see you in, in the near future in person in Lisbon, Portugal. So have a great, great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Wait, wait, Thank you. Know, let me take that selfie, the group selfie. Everybody smile. <laughs> Wait a minute. I must not be doing the right thing. Oh, yes. Take a selfie. Okay. All right. Where's the selfie button? Oh, okay. It was under that notice. One, two, three. There you go, ladies. We'll use use those selfies. And I'm not sure if we actually took a group one or not. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this looks like this looks like a... Did you take a selfie of yourself, by the way? Are you talking to me? Yes. Yeah. I, I think I just did. I've never done that before. Okay, so that's my selfie. I'm going to just save it for the heck of it, but you should have gotten a, uh, I don't know if that's the selfie for us or, or the selfie for this thing. But anyway, let me do a quick quick screenshot. Was it your screenshot. selfie? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do a quick <laughs> screenshot here, and then I'll, I'll just send it to you guys. So one, two, three, smile. I think I got it. All right, ladies, have a great Thank day, you. and let's stay in touch. Thank you. Yeah, to Thank you. Next week, Angela. All right. Thank then, you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.